and welcome to Virtual Insights, Jordan Nassar on memory and embroidery. Thank you for joining us across time zones today. And please know that closed captioning in English is available today by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. My name is Natalie Bell, Senior Educator and Manager of Student Engagement at the American Folk Art Museum. As we begin today's program, I want to acknowledge that our museum stands upon Lenape Hoking, the unceded traditional homeland of the Lenape Delaware peoples. We honor Lenape people, past, present, and future, and are committed to centering indigenous perspectives and exhibitions and programs at the museum. As many of you know, AFAM is dedicated to uplifting the work of self-taught artists across time and place, and we're thrilled to celebrate our 60th anniversary with our exhibition, Multitudes, now on view at Two Lincoln Square through early September. We hope you make plans to come visit and see this rich exhibition, which features over 400 artworks drawn entirely from the museum's collection. We're grateful for opportunities like this to connect online, which would not be possible without the NEH and all of you. Now to turn to today's program, we're honored and thrilled to be joined today by artist Jordan Nassar, who will be exploring the theme of memory and embroidery as it relates to his own practice and select artworks featured in multitudes. We'll start today's program by hearing from Jordan, but we invite you to share your questions throughout the program. And please be sure to use that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. And we'll make every effort to respond to as many of those as possible at the end of our time together. Um, so it's my honor to introduce Jordan Nassar. And could we get the next slide, please? Jordan Nassar's hand embroidered pieces address the intersection of craft, ethnicity, and the embedded notions of heritage and homeland. Treating traditional craft more as medium than topic, Nassar examines conflicting issues of identity and cultural participation using geometric patterning adapted from symbols and motifs present in traditional Palestinian hand embroidery. Meticulously hand stitching colorful compositions across carefully mapped out patterns he roots his practice in a geopolitical field of play characterized by both conflict and unspoken harmony. His work has been featured in solo and group exhibitions globally at institutions including the Orlando Museum of Art, Center for Contemporary Art Tel Aviv, Princeton University Art Museum, Museum of Arts and Design New York, Katona Museum of Art, among others. Recent notable exhibitions include Making Knowing Craft and Art at the Whitney Museum, in New York, the Asia Society Triennial, We Do Not Dream Alone in New York, and The Field is Infinite, a solo exhibition at KMAC Museum in Louisville, Kentucky. His 2022 solo exhibitions include presentations at Kupcha Gallery, Seoul, Anat Egby, Los Angeles, James Cohen, New York, and the Institute of Contemporary Art, ICA, Boston, which is opening in August, very exciting. Jordan is represented by James Cohen, New York, and not Egby, Los Angeles, in the third line, Dubai. A warm welcome, Jordan. How are you today? Thank you, I'm good. <clears throat> All right, good. Let's, get, let's get into it. So um, this is the first, we're looking at this installation of your current exhibition at James Cohen. And um, for you know some of our audience members who may not be as um, familiar with your work, um, I'm struck first by the scale of these, these works and, you know, when entering into this space, one might be first inclined to, to read them as paintings, and maybe, maybe that is partly the way that you look at them, um, but they are embroidered, and, you know, so I think when, when I think of embroidery, you know, I often think of those handheld embroidery hoops and, you know, sort of domestic craft and textile, um, and it's when we kind of get closer to your works that we start to have that intimacy with the threads and the patterns. And can we go to the next slide, please, so we can get a, a view of um, one of these pieces individually. That's great, thank you. So um, I'm just curious, what was your relationship with, with embroidery growing up? Um, embroidery specifically came later. I just, I mean, I always describe myself as you know having been a craft inclined kid <laughs> um, and I, like when I was really young, I was like obsessed with origami, like, like, you know, when I was like six or seven. Uh, and then as I got older, got into like crocheting and weaving and just kind of like, you know, more towards textiles. Um, and it kind of, 
it, the embroidery came about when, later when I started to make artwork in my 20s. Um, and that was more of like, I was, I was, I was really kind of engaging with, you know, questions around how I relate to my Palestinian heritage and so on and so forth. And um, I think the mix of like being craft inclined and looking for something Palestinian to kind of do, it was just kind of the obvious thing because the, the you know, you grow up, I could, I, I almost want to say like every single Palestinian person around the world has a piece of this embroidery in their house. Um, and so I certainly grew up with pillows and stuff that my father would bring back. And so it just kind of seemed like an obvious, like it was the first thing to come to mind, but it's also, you know, arguably Palestine's like best known export culturally. Um, and so, and most kind of like emblematic and, uh, and so, yeah, so I just started, um, started embroidering and I mean it's fairly accessible like you only need a needle and thread and some fabric to start so um that kind of began the process of learning a lot more about it and then when I would be in Palestine seeking out embroiderers and and shops and all that kind of stuff um and collecting samples but also just learning more so much more about it um and yeah and so and, and so it really is my primary medium but as you kind of oh, I don't think you mentioned it yet but it's not my only medium I'm like expanding in the recent years towards uh to include like other crafts from Palestine so I'm sticking with the Palestinian crafts um but I've been working in glass and also like wood uh like wood inlay brass and mother pearl inlay so um but embroidery is definitely the central medium for me and it's, it's effectively the way that I paint like I kind of retroactively discovered I'm a painter so to speak but just not with actual paint yeah <laughs> That's how I see it. <laughs> um and so the way these are typically constructed is um what we're seeing in terms of the areas that are like pure pattern are those are um came out of your collaboration with with Palestinian embroiderers and so those are sort of typically outsourced. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so I, you know, in the first years I was making work, I was just embroidering by myself. Um, and the pieces were full landscape. So kind of imagine with this piece that's up on the screen, like if just the Green Mountain panel was a whole, that was the piece that I made pieces like that. And then um, over the years of traveling in Palestine, I you know, one thing led to another and I had contact with embroiderers who did commission work, which a lot of them do, um, either locally for people in their communities or for tourists and stuff, um, or even like companies that want to make a handbag and they want embroidered textiles or something. And uh, so, you know, once I, once I was connected with um, women who do commission work, I started having them make pieces form like produce them for me but also uh more so than that because I don't specify how they should turn out I just design the actual patterns so that I can control like the size and scale and shape of the piece um and also like you know what patterns are used and stuff like that um but you know at at the most I'll give them a color palette like I'll like for this one I said red and gray and black and but I did not specify where they should put which color and for me that's really important because it makes it collaborative in a sense that they have aesthetic input and it's extra important because um you know my work a lot of it is about kind of seeking to understand my relationship to my Palestinian identity and Palestine itself and this feeling of kind of always being an outsider, even though I'm Palestinian and so on and so forth. And so I, I love to highlight that, like, I do this traditional craft differently than they, they do. And that requires them to do it in their style. So, you know, the direction that I give them is use the colors Palestinian style, which is obviously very vague and leaves a lot up to them. And they're going to rely on their own personal taste, but also that is very greatly informed by um, this like living cultural practice, right? Of like how patterns are divided up into different colors, 
how they tend to be done that way. And that will, of course, also slightly differ between from woman to woman, or she'll have picked up kind of certain tendencies from her mother or grandmother who taught her. And so I really want to access that and include that in the work as, you know, the traditional element to juxtapose then with my kind of outsiders inside, like I'm a member of this group of Palestinians around the world, but I'm also an outsider. I'm an American. I'm born and raised here. Um, and so it kind of highlights that in a visual way. Um, and it's, it's, you know, as an artist, uh, it's always, you know, it's fun to make a work exactly how I imagine, but, and I'm, and I continually make works that are just me embroidering, but this ongoing collaborative body of work is the way for me to like spice it up a little bit where I don't really know exactly what I'm going to get back from them. And so it's really fun for me because once I receive it back, the, the, the piece that they've done, I have to then, only then can I like look at it and figure out what I want to do with my section um, in terms of colors and composition. And these pieces at James Cohan are separate panels all put together into one piece. But up until now, my collaborations with uh, the Palestinian women have actually been single pieces where there's like a field of patterning that they've embroidered and then an empty space, which I embroider afterwards. So this is the first time that I've separated them into panels and that's really to get the scale to grow. Um, and in the, in the past, it's, it's, it's been them and me embroidering and making one piece essentially together. And that to me, it was also really important. I love the idea that the pieces wouldn't exist without this connection and, and um, really just, I don't know, it, it highlights this relationship and, and becomes kind of a metaphor for that in a sense, I don't know, um, but yeah. Yeah, well, let's zoom in a little because I think our next slide um, is, you know, we'll give uh, viewers more of a sense of the labor that goes into these um, as well as the patterning. And then also this is, um, you're sort of disrupting the traditional patterns with these landscape images. And um, so could you like just, describe for us a little bit of where, how these landscapes originated and what, what their meaning is for you right. in these pieces. Well, I will first say that the patterning is um, also, so there's basically there's kind of two distinct creative processes that happen in making one piece. Um, the first is the patterning part of the creative process because the patterns that I use are traditional patterns that are found on dresses and pillowcases and all the stuff that they make in Palestine traditionally. But the way that I arrange the patterns on the canvases is already kind of different than they do. They tend not to, like I'll take, like this pattern, for example, is a cypress tree. And there's many different ways. Cypress tree motifs are very um, like popular in Palestine, but they differ greatly from region to region, um, how they do the cypress tree. And I found this one um, along the way, and I use this one pretty much exclusively when it comes to the cypress tree pattern, because it's very full. There's not a lot of white empty space. Um, and that is the best for me because I'll be cutting across them with mountain lines. And so you don't want a lot of empty space because then the line will be really choppy. And so I tend to use this one, but this would be used, this pattern, for example, you would see it more maybe as like a border or like just a stripe down a sleeve or something like that. Um, and you wouldn't really see it as like a densely repeated full field of this pattern. And so there's already like a contemporary or not necessarily contemporary, but like outsider, you know, not the typical way of using this particular pattern that shows up in my work. So that's already part of that whole dichotomy. Um, and that's pretty much goes for almost all the patterns that I use. There are some that will show up in a field, um, but mostly, you know, already in the patterning process, I'm differing from what you'd find traditionally, even though the actual symbols are traditional. Um, and then after that, I basically end up with you know, a black and white printout. Like I, I designed these on the computer just, you know, for copying, pasting and kind of planning and then print it out in black and white. And then I draw. So then it becomes the beginning of the second process, which is essentially painterly, right? It's formal. It's considering color and composition like most paintings do. 
and it's kind of distinct from the pattern. Like the pattern is just giving me my field that I'm going to be able to paint on. And then the composition comes by hand. And, you know, oftentimes the compositions are like, you know, I'm picturing something in my mind and I'm trying my best to capture it on the canvas. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of time to change your mind or make little changes or edit um, because, you know, each section of one color takes, you know, a long time to do. And so you can think about, you know, I usually have like a handful of balls of thread kind of as my color palette for that piece and have in mind like, okay, I think this color is gonna be the next one. But then when I get down there, I'll be like, you know what? I think I want something darker or like whatever. So there's a lots of time to keep editing, which for me, I never was like a drawer or a painter. And I feel like in a sense, I never felt like I was good at it. And I do think partially for me, there was an element of like, it's too fast and my hand goes faster than my brain wants it to or something. And so the fact that this is slowed down to like a glacial pace, I think is very helpful for me in terms of being able to draw the lines exactly how I want to draw them and so on and so forth. Um, so it makes so much sense. Yeah. yeah. And can we go to the next slide? Cause I want to also, I want everyone to see this next piece too, which is, um, you know, using like a different set of colors. Um, and I mean, I would love, just love for you to talk a little bit about the colors going on in this, because I, I just see, you know, there's some wonderful contrast, um, and um, I would just love to know a little bit more about your process with this one. Um, so essentially part of, um, okay, so, so these pieces for this show that have all the separate panels that are put together in one frame originated, the idea for these originated because the fabric that I embroider on is only 66 inches wide, but you get a whole roll of it. And so it can go on forever, but, the the you know the short dimension is not going to change and so the challenge was how do i make pieces that are wider than like taller than that and wider like, you know what i mean like how do i go both direct grow both directions and the answer was well i mean one answer is to do separate panels like then get combined um but then what happened is i realized that instead of doing um like three rectangular large panels just to make it bigger I could play with the panels and kind of make them into their own pattern that's like another layer of pattern on top of the patterns of the stitches so it just became like another element to play with and be creative with um but what I loved about this process also was that um really to highlight the fact that um because remember all the panels around the central one are embroidered by the Palestinian women and then I embroider the central panel of the landscape and so it really highlighting the importance of not even importance but the effect of where you choose to place what color and you know the effect that that has on the final result um I love this piece especially because it really highlights that, that um so if you see the, the the vertical panel all the way to the right has a black background with different colored stars. And then the vertical panel all the way to the left has the beige background with different color stars. They're all the same four colors on every panel that the women embroidered, but choosing to put the black on that one as the background and the beige and that one really changes what that pattern feels like. And the same goes for the top and bottom flower pattern. And then the two side ones kind of in the middle that is this a little bit more um, figurative floral motif. Um, and so that really, to me, was became like a, a, a kind of secondary thing. And, and, and it's fun because it is symmetrical, but also not symmetrical and doesn't quite feel symmetrical because the, 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 the black side feels like so much stronger of like a rectangle shape than the beige background side. And so it really just plays with all those variations that are possible. Um, and then the landscape that I embroidered in the middle because mind you, when I send them the, the patterns and I send color, a color palette, I'm not giving them like Pantones. Like I'm just saying like light green, dark blue and what exact shade of that that they're gonna have access to or choose is up to them. And so I wait until I get it back to then decide like what colors I want 
going to use to either be in harmony with the colors they chose or, you know, um, or play against those colors and be contrasting. And so you can see in the landscape, there's a lot of greens and some blues, and then the yellow sun kind of relates to that beige color. And then this red mountain in the cent center part, it kind of sticks out as like the wild card color and creates just a little bit of tension in the composition um, that otherwise is quite serene in terms of the color palette um, and harm like harmonious with the background and stuff. Um, Cause in a sense, the women's panels in my mind become a background for the landscape to play off of. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the, that's that's what's going on in these pieces, essentially. Yeah, I love that color inversion. And um, the next slide, if we could get that, is um, I believe a close close up here so folks can get a sense. Right. And there was a, a question about the white and the white is the fabric, the backing fabric. Right, right? the white is negative space. Yeah. And that creates the pattern you see, obviously. Um, and yeah, so, so not every, it's not like um, when you have like a like a needlework, traditional needlework pillow or something where every square is stitched. It's not like that. It's empty spaces and filled spaces. And then the filled spaces, which create the pattern, are the, you could call it pixels that I have to work with in terms of what color right. to give them. Well, let's go to the next slide and look at some of the inspiration behind um, some of these works. So, um, am I, so this is um, traditional Palestinian embroidery, and are these all from your collection, Jordan? No, actually, these are just from the internet, um, but they're good examples. I do have like basically the same thing, <laughs> it's like right here, like pillows and stuff. Um, but these are just good, you know, just nice examples of traditional Palestinian embroidery. These all happen to be on black fabric. They are done on other color fabrics, tend to be black or in some regions on like natural, like kind of a cream color. Um, and other, I've seen them on denim. I've seen them on various uh, silks and stuff from Syria and that kind of stuff. Like it just depends on, you know, what, what people had access to at different times. And in this dress actually, the sleeves, you see how there's like a, a colored band at the top. That is um, a fabric called Majdalawi fabric. It's from a, a, a village in Palestine or a city in Palestine called Majdal, which is no longer there and is now <clears throat> the city of Ashkelon in Israel. And um, this is one of my favorite fabrics because it is, unique to Palestine and is a little bit more of a rare fabric because it's a it's a it's a warp faced weave rather than weft so like the colored threads are put in the loom in the pattern that you see and then a tiny thread is like shuttled back and forth just to hold it together and this because of Israel destroying the city and taking it over um the this this tradition of weaving has all but been lost there's one or two people doing it still in gaza who are refugees from the uh, you know the original village and um i've been lucky enough to work with them also on other projects i made some how like i did an installation where i made furniture and had it upholstered in custom woven versions of this fabric in like my own color palettes or whatever um but so yeah so there's so there's a lot of a lot that goes into the dresses, but just for just for a, um, just for an example of like you know how they would place the patterns. Palestinian embroidery is very well known for the density of cross stitch because there's cross stitch all over the world, but there's certain tendencies that different cultures will have and how they apply it to clothing. And in Palestine, they're very much known for especially the chest panel, um, and you know these 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 chest panels especially had more than one function, right? They're, the one thing is that they're, they're decorative, they're just beautiful. Um, women would make their own dresses primarily. And so, um, you know, it's something very personal and um, something that she would be proud of wearing her dress. But also um, there are different symbols that are used in different areas of Palestine or different specific cities. And so the dress oftentimes, you know, in the height of this being practiced by everyone, um, the dress would help identify 
you to others where you're from. Um, different color combinations could indicate you're single or married or widowed. Um, and there's also superstitious things that I love about it. The triangle on the chest um, is actually derived from a superstition about the warding off the evil eye. Um, and so there's often, the chest panels are often, not always, never always, but often composed with kind of a square or rectangles or kind of boxy motif from the shoulders down. And then at mid chest becomes a triangle. Um, and so those are like certain tendencies about specifically Palestinian composition of the embroideries um, on the clothing that is, you know, special. And the one other thing that I thought about with these panel pieces in the James Cohen show is that when a woman is making one of these dresses for herself, she's gonna be making each panel separately and only at the end combining them to be the dress. And so I love how the pieces kind of mimic that process where they're not, it's not complete until they're all brought together and put in one frame. Um, I love so that. I love that yeah. little, a little shout out to the, <laughs> the tradition, but. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go to the, I think there's a close up of, um, of some of this embroidery in the next slide. Um, did you just want to like briefly um, talk about this technique? Yeah, this is a different technique. So this is not cross stitch. This is called Tahriri embroidery. It's also known as Bethlehem um, embroidery. It's uh, very much uh, widely done in Bethlehem traditionally. And it is a different um, embroidery technique. It's called couching. And couching means that you lay a piece of thread on the face of the fabric, and then you use small stitches to just hold it down. And so you can see these swirls and lines are continuous pieces of thread that are just held down. And this is also not unique to Palestine. Um, my fa actually, my favorite example of this this technique is from Yemen, which I forgot to like mention the other day when we were putting together images, because um, they do really crazy stuff with it in Yemen. Um, but this is the style, and it looks quite different than this. Um, this is the look that they they do in Bethlehem with this, um, and this will enter back into the conversation when we look at some of the pieces from the exhibition. Right. Um, well, let's keep going um, to the next slide because um, I want to talk a little bit, we can um, talk about, and this was relating back to the um, the dresses that you were just speaking on. Um, right. But um, I think so these this, are the last of the embroideries um, that we have for you to show, and then we'll move on to some of the other materials yeah. you've been working with. But, um, oh, yeah. but I love the, the connection with the dresses with these pieces. So this piece is from a presentation I did in 2020 at the ADA Art Show um, with James Cohen Gallery. And this exhibition was the first time I've ever done pieces on, not on this, you know, plain fabric, like, like cream colored natural fabric, did it on black fabric. And the whole exhibition was, I have a dress here that I bought in Jerusalem that's like over a hundred years old and it's a black dress and has mostly dark blue embroidery with a lot of like brighter colors thrown in, especially on the chest panel. And for that exhibition, I basically re-embroidered each kind of panel of the dress as a painting in terms of the pattern and color palette, but then instead made landscapes and stuff. Um, and so essentially, the, the dress like spawned all these pieces. So there was one piece that was like the chest panel. There was one piece that was like the bottom front of the dress um, panel that's larger. And this is actually um, a, a, another kind of stitch. It's most similar to satin stitch in like Western embroidery, um, but in Arabic they call it manajal, which means like a sickle. And it is used for decorative purposes, but also to like join a seam or to cover a seam that you've sewed together. Like you then do this kind of satin stitch across it to just make it look prettier and cover up the actual seam being sewed together. Um, and so the dress that I based that exhibition off of had bands of this stitch along the whole bottom hem. I think partially to give it weight, just to like hold it down, partially to give it extra strength because if it drags on the floor a little bit like it's not gonna 
um, cause the whole dress to start falling apart. Um, and so this is actually, in, in terms of the dress, this is like the whole bottom, um, like circumference of the dress, like the, the, the whole bottom of the dress, just the border. And um, so that's why there's like no stitches in the center. It's just the edge. Um, but it's a, it's a very strange piece and it's like one of my favorites I've ever made. It's so weird. And like, I wish I should have, we should have included a close up, but like it really like- I do think the, you may, we might have a close up next actually. The, um, the way that this, yeah, the way that the stitch is done, you have wider stretches of the of the thread. So it's really kind of sh it like shines in a different way than the cross stitch. Um, and you can see the stitch is composed of two, like each one row is actually two rows that kind of meet. Cause again, it's like holding, it's like a seam and it's actually right. embroidered in like kind of a figure eight through the fabric so that it's 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 like binding it it's like holding it together right so there's this kind of like bump in the middle no it's like there's a valley in the middle so like right. each one looks like that kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> great um well thank you i let's go on let's move to the next slide because i think um next we have some of your glass beading work um which is so exciting and um, it's a, a, a slightly newer medium for you, um, but you've been embracing the doing a lot of this uh, craft yourself. So um, if you could just tell us, you know, how these beaded works evolved and, and yeah, what your absolutely. process like. So I was once in Hebron, um, and it Hebron is known for a few things, craft-wise, but especially for the glass work that they do there. They've been doing it for thousands of years. The ancient Romans, like when they made it all the way there, they were like, it became like a prized thing to bring back is like glass from Hebron. Um, and they, you know, and, and they largely make like cups and little pitchers and stuff like that. But, you know, bowls, all the usual stuff. But while I was there, I noticed a small like sconce that they had um that was beaded with these little beads of all just the same color glass and I think we have a, an image the yeah, next slide thank you the next slide uh, oh the next slide or maybe the yeah. one after that <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to this but yeah this is so fun. okay so this is the original kind of sconce thing that I brought back I call it a sconce I don't really know what it is because it doesn't I guess you could like put it over a light bulb sticking out of the wall, but I think it's more like used just as a decoration itself. And it's very like weatherable. So you can have it in the garden on the wall out there or something, maybe put a plant in, I don't know. Like it's just, they have, they make these. And so I, you know, the way that the embroidery, my, the embroidery that I do treats each stitch to be kind of silly, uh, treats each stitch like a pixel that I can change the color of. This is a similar thing where I was like, oh, beaded. I could like, what if I just did different colors and could make like mountains? So this was the original inspiration. And the, uh, you know, the bead shape, I maintain the same shape of the beads that I make. And then the structure of how it's put together is the same where there is a steel, you know, like a scaffold essentially that you attach each bead to with wires. Um, and just one by one, you wrap, the beads are not, they don't have a hole in it. They have, um, it's kind of, it's almost like a, you know, the, the marble-ish like round head of the bead. And then there's like a smaller waist and then there's like a little butt. And so you wrap a wire around this, the waist and then you attach that wire to the scaffold. And so now if you want to go back to, to the- Yeah, we can the, go backwards, yeah. But um, yeah, so here you can see a close up of, the beads that I've made in a piece. And then if you go back one more slide, you'll see like that whole piece again. Um, but essentially, so so from that, the pieces became this, which the first round of glass pieces I did was for an exhibition in 2020. And they were all freestanding um, kind of structures that just had mountainscapes on them. And that was like my first go, the first place that my imagination brought me. Um, and for the second body of glass works, which are in the show right now at James Cohan, um, 
I wanted to incorporate patterning because I felt that, you know, the embroidery has this play between pattern and landscape. And I wanted to include that element in these. So I started, I had to invent patterns for these because, um, you know, the traditional embroidery patterns are on a grid, right? It's cross stitch, but these glass beads are arranged actually in like a honeycomb arrangement, not a grid arrangement. So I couldn't just like copy and paste patterns from the, from the embroidery to the, the glass, which was a fun challenge to just like be creative and um, get to use my pattern, pattern brain um, to make some patterns. And then they effectively do a lot of the similar things visually as the embroideries where you have a pattern that's composed of a handful of colors and then an embroidery that is composed of similar or the same colors plus some additional colors and like kind of plays with that. Um, I work with a metal worker friend of mine and for whatever reason, I think I just enjoy the floweriness of the you know, ironwork like gates and those kind of decorative ironwork. And so I thought that that would be a fun way to hold the two sides together. Um, and, you know, one thing led to another and that's what I did. And my friend who's very talented made all of these um, joining ironwork sections by hand because like from scratch, because they're all based on ironwork that you'll see all around New York, but the scale is much smaller than like, because originally I thought maybe I'll just like go to a scrapyard and get some ironwork, but the scale is off because if it's for a fence, it's going to be much longer to have one complete iteration of that design. And so we needed to like shrink them down. And so he was like, I'll just make them from scratch, which is just exciting. And these also have, um, these kind of thicker frame on them, which the ones, the first ones I did did not have. Also the first ones I did were freestanding, so they didn't need like a frame to hang them by. Um, but I really love that it just gives these such a finished look to have the frame on them already. And they're just like, yeah, I'm really happy with the kind of the next steps that happen in this, in this medium for me. Um, and as you mentioned, it is really important to me because, you know, the whole point of working with Palestinian crafts is about me doing Palestinian things and like being more Palestinian, so to speak, that way and engaging with that heritage and culture. And so it is about learning how to do it for me. I love doing crafts, as I mentioned, since I was a child. And so it's really fun for me to get to learn how to do these different things and um, then see where <laughs> see where I go with them, you know? But the first step of any medium I work with is always trying to get really good at it just technically, because then only then can you really start to manipulate it exactly how you want, right? right. Um, and so it really is about craft and like the fact that craft is not just about using craft materials. Craft is about learning the craft, like how to do the craft, the techniques, that are required to do the craft, right? Um, and so that's definitely at the crux of everything for me. It's like, I'm doing it with my hands and learning how to do that. And, you know, um, and, and it really just changes the relationship with the work as well, because I, I feel like if I had had these beads made for me, I would be, I wouldn't even know how to handle them. I'd be worried I was gonna break them or whatever, but having made them, I know how sturdy they are. I know what they can handle. I know how to like, I know how much I could push if one doesn't want to like sit where it's going to sit. You know what I mean? Like it's just that. Yeah, you're really part of it. Yeah. yeah. I really make it mine and I feel like I couldn't have it any other way at this point. Um, Let's um, flip forward in the slides, I think maybe three more and there's an image. There we go. Um, mm -hmm. Some images of the glass process, um, which right. I know that you, you work with a local um, glass shop in Brooklyn. Yeah, I work at Brooklyn Glass, which is just a couple blocks from here. And I effectively just, I took one lesson. So I brought them a bead, I brought them beads from, I took apart that green one that I have from Palestine. Well, I have, I have multiple and I have one intact. And then I have one that I like scavenger. I took everything off to like inspect how it was made and stuff. Um, and so I took them some sample beads and I took a lesson effectively where they taught me how to make the that bead. So actually my glass, work uh, skill is pretty limited to like these beads. Like it's really hard. It's much harder than you think to do flame work. 
Um, and some, sometimes I observe other people working who have also, because you can basically just rent a table for a day and do whatever you want to do. Um, and so sometimes I get to watch other people who are making crazy little figurines or like whatever. And I'm just like, that is so, because it's really a game of like, how hot everything is. Cause if it's too cold, it's gonna explode. If it's too hot, it's gonna melt. If you're joining two things, they have to be like similar temperatures. Otherwise it's gonna explode, et cetera. So it's really hard to do stuff that has like multiple, like a horse or something that has just like all these parts. Like it's very crazy. Anyway, so I learned how to make these beads um, and they're just made one by one like that. So the stick that that bead is on the end of is what you start with is just a stick of like a rod of glass. And then all the glass comes from Italy. Um, and this is soft glass, which just means it, it melts at a slightly lower temperature than other kinds of glass. Um, and so it's ideal for working with, for stuff like this. And yeah, you just one by one kind of use different tools to gather up a ball of glass, like of like molten glass at the end and then you know, make that shape of the waist with like the little bump at the end and then you cut it off and you put it in the, you know, this other photo is a photo of the annealer it's called, which um, basically it's kind of like a kiln or something. It's a, it's an oven of sorts that um, raises all the glass up to one temperature because glass is, I mean, I don't want to go I don't have to teach you everything about glass, but basically glass is such a poor conductor of heat that even this tiny bead, one side could be hundreds of degrees hotter than the other side. And if it cools at different rates, it might explode. So what you have to do is bring it all up to the same temperature in the oven. And then overnight, like over eight hours, the temperature slowly drops down to room temperature so that the whole piece of glass cools at the same rate. Because if you think about it on a physics level, like something being hot means the atom, the molecules are vibrating fast and cool is vibrating slow. And so you can imagine that friction, if like this part is vibrating really fast and the other part is slow, it might just pop, right? Um, anyway, so that's what these are pictures of. Amazing. <laughs> I, I feel like, yeah, we could almost have our whole separate talk just about like these, you know, different practices. And yeah. I mean, if that weren't enough to go to the next slide, because I don't want us, I want us to have enough time um is uh some of your wood inlay work which is oh, yeah. you know yet another um uh you know craft form that um you've you know taught yourself um so and this i think is our last uh image of your work before we move on to works from from the multitudes exhibition okay. so you know just briefly I, I would love to know um how these evolved and obviously you're still using the juxtaposition of the landscape with the pattern frame. Right. Um, so these are basically inspired by Middle Eastern furniture. This kind of inlay work is found also all over the world, but especially North Africa, Syria, the Levant, and also even India and like places like that. But, um, you know, in, these were inspired by, you know, like a little coffee, a little side table or something that you might have that has this mother of pearl and brass inlay on it. Um, but of course was like, I wanted to incorporate a landscape. Um, so this is from my show that was a few months ago at a not Abbey gallery in LA. And there were five pieces. One was the triangle, one was a square. This is the um, pentagon. And then there was a hexagon and a heptagon. Um, and I worked with a woodworker friend of mine who's like a master woodworker. And he's also uh, like, uh, he's just like in love with wood. And so he was the perfect person to do this with because he has collected over the years, just little chunks of like so many different kinds of woods, rare woods, his neighbor, his like neighbor's apple tree and like this, that like stuff from a decade ago that's just sitting on a shelf. And so for these wood pieces, we were able to take just like small, like quarter inch little cuts of those, a wide variety of woods. Um, to use as the different colors of mountains because we did not use any stains for this. All the different colors of wood and different textures are just the different species of wood. Um, and so he, as the master woodworker, would build, so I would design the piece. He would build the like whole thing, like right this, he built like this pentagon shape. 
and then he would inlay the different mountains as per, as like according to my design and then i come in and do the kind of finer work which is the brass inlay so in between each mountain i've put a piece of like a line of brass to kind of give it a little extra kind of shape or like just to highlight the 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 lines and then the borders become like my main task of doing designs that effectively read as Middle Eastern because like similarly to the Palestinian embroidery being very dense, what makes this Middle Eastern inlay work, specifically Middle Eastern, is the geometric patterns and the density of the inlay work. And so, um, so yeah, and then I set out to just literally one by one with a chisel cut out the shape, like cut. So inlay is like you cut down into the, the base wood and you like chisel out exactly the right shape and the right depth for whatever you want to like drop in there. Um, and so, yeah, so just start, you know, and lots of, lots of like drawing with rulers and like measuring everything out. Cause it's, it's geometry for sure. But, um, but, but yeah, just, just like everything else, just like tedious, <laughs> craft <laughs> techniques that take a really long time but um but yeah I'm like I love these pieces I love working with wood um and yeah I just feel really good about like you know the embroideries are so soft these wood pieces are so like earthy and like kind of golden and the brass is shiny and like yellow and um the mother of pearl is often quite pearlescent and like has weird like rainbow colors and reflections and then um the glass and the glass pieces are just glass and metal they feel so cold not in a bad way but just like a completely different element you know what I mean like I feel like there's a really nice um, so all these different sensory things yeah in each yeah one. yeah um, well, thank you so much. I think we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about some of the works in multitudes, um, starting with um, the embroideries. Um, and, and so we're starting with this sampler. Um, I think we're going to look at a couple of different samplers with you, but um, this one made um, around 1789 by um, an 11-year-old girl, Ruthie Rogers, as you can see. Um, she's added her name here. Um, yeah, and you know, just, you know, these were traditions of, you know, schoolgirl traditions. They would have, you know, learned from the teacher um, at the school and oftentimes incorporated a particular school or particular teacher would have like pushed particular motifs. Um, so, you know, kind of regionally, there are some um, similarities um, depending on, on these types of samplers. But you know, typically not a lot is known about about these makers. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious. You know, what was your take? You know, looking at these in the multitudes exhibition, and I know we have a we have a close up of this one as well. Um, maybe we can go to that. Yeah, I mean, I I I chose this one um, because it relates back to what I was talking about about. Um, the, just the, a few of the other stitches that are used in Palestinian embroidery other than cross stitch. And this is a really great example of the same stitches that I was discussing. So these little acorns along the border and the little kind of checkered border line between the acorns and then the grass or whatever. Uh, and then also the flower pot here, those are all cross stitch. So the same exact technique as done in Palestine. And then the fill that is done, like the, the crazy swirls of the flowers and the grass itself and the tree and her dress and all that stuff is done with satin stitch, which is again, um, what the Palestinians use for the, for the seams, um, the decorative seams. And so I just thought it was a cool example because it's like the same stitches just applied totally different ways based on like cultural, style and tendencies um right right so I mean, there's some universality in these crafts right. exactly and it's cool just to see that like you know the same exact technique is happening it's just different applications and different aesthetics right well let's go to the next sampler which is a little bit more of a traditional um 
what we might think of when we think of schoolgirl samplers, where we have the, like the alphabet and the you know the numbers, and she's written um, uh, you know the date, um, and then you know we have the bottom part is filled with these you know sort of stylized houses and trees. Um, actually, I was thinking about the cypress cypress tree uh, patterning when looking at some of these because they're just triangles, you know, but. Um, really? <laughs> But I, I mean, one thing I always say about cross stitch is that, you know, it's a grid. There's only so many things that naturally you can do with a grid, right? So you can either do triangles, squares, rectangles, lines, zigzags. Um, you can do kind of like checker boxes, you know, because those are kind of the op. That's what naturally comes of that structure. And so, and every once in a while, um, you'll come across from two like wildly different cultures, the same exact motif. And that's just because like, it's the nature of the, the options you have, like, cause it's basically a binary, right? Like empty or filled is your choice between for each stitch, right? Um, and that generates a pattern. And I just loved this one because, you know, there's a lot of similarities and, and so forth, but the, there's that like light blue line underneath the larger, alphabet underneath the second part of the larger alphabet um there's that light blue like chain link looking mm -hmm. stitch and that is a stitch that is we find in palestinian embroidery exactly also as like a border stitch and i'm assuming that this um woman in portland maine in 1791 was not <laughs> getting this from palestinian embroidery samples um so it's just like you know it goes to show like you know it, there is this universality about it, but, you know, again, how it's applied and arranged in terms of the composition of the patterns or arrangement of the patterns on different objects is wildly different depending on culture. Um, and so I just like love that example because that's literally exactly a pattern that we have. Um, and yeah. That's Great. like my main note about that one. Yeah. Well, let's move. We have, I think, one more um, like needlework um, picture to show. And then there's, um, we have a couple of more after that. But yeah, um, yeah this, this one is more of like, a, I don't know, how would you differentiate this? Uh, I mean, you know, the ones one, we just saw. Well, this one is full coverage of embroidery thread, whereas the other ones employed like negative space and stitches. Um, so that's one major difference of this one. The other one about, the other thing about this one is it incorporates um, the satin stitch mainly, and then also French knots. So like the tree, the kind of tree towards the center by the horse, like that, all the leaves are done with French knots. The sheep's fur is done with French knots, um, which is something you don't find. I think we have a detail. If we go to the next slide, we can look at some of those um, specific. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. So the the tree and the sheep are French knots, um, and that, but not the tree, not the not the trunks of the tree, just the leaves, um, and then everything else looks like sand stitch pretty much, um, and yeah, I mean it's just it, it's just like a totally different vibe. But I just love this one because it's so like pastoral and naturey, and and I like the. There's like the way that they did shading with the different colors of satin stitch, like by the edge of the lake, there's like that brown, or even just like how the lake is done is really cute with all the little blue, the little blue like bumps or whatever to like tell you that's water. I don't know. I yeah, like this. It's just, it was like so clearly like loved and labored over, um, but it's also and clearly like the effect was meant to be this sort of idealized pastoral elegant landscape. Um, yeah. And I wonder if like the thread, cause the tree, for example, is made up of all different color threads, but I'm curious as to whether maybe those were like hand dyed and just like not dyed consistently or they chose to use like multiple colors, whatever. It's, it's just really, I mean, the way that she, she did the dresses and the ducks, like it's also cute and creative. I don't know, I, I like this one. <laughs> Um, well, thank you. Let's let's go now to the next um, piece from Multitudes that caught your eye. Um, okay, so yeah, we did have one more embroidery piece, and this is quite different as it was made in the 60s. Um, 
And um, this artist, Mary Borkowski, um, did a whole series of embroidered works that had, you know, more of sort of symbolic narrative um, elements, but um, but I know that there was like specific technique in this that you were that you were interested in, right? So what I love about this one is that it is basically the same stitches that we were talking about before. The flames, all the actually all the like everything but the house like frame is done with satin stitch. So that's the same stitches the Palestinians do the the seams with, and then the house itself, like kind of the brick tile work or whatever the, the the roof and all that stuff I think the next slide is a close-up yeah we can go to the next one um so th all those like individual lines that create you know the shape of the roof and stuff is couching so that's what we were talking about the Bethlehem style where a piece of thread is laid down and then little stitches are like done often in a contrasting color to like just hold that down on the face and that's why these lines are like so pronounced and straight is because they're actually just one piece of thread that's just being held down right um, so I just love that because again it goes back to what we were saying about like different aesthetics but the same techniques right right and there being kind of a limited menu of options when you are working with a particular material um um Great. And, but just the variety of what you can do with those, you know, things right. as well. Um, I love how this artist like let the, you know, the, it, it, they're almost like there's a quilting effect that happens by doing all those lines where the base fabric is like puffing out in between them. And that just has a really nice like three dimensional feeling to it. Yeah, this and I think she, even the artist thought of her embroideries as more sculptures or like a, sort of like a low relief sculpture. Um, yeah. So that totally makes sense. Um, and then I think the next piece is actually a quilt um, uh, from the exhibition Multitudes, um, a log cabin quilt from that was made by a mother daughter um, during the time of the Civil War. And of course, you're, you're not a quilter, but, um, but what was, why did this um, strike you? Yeah, so basically what I loved about this one, just as an example, was that it's effectively a similar visual trick as what I do with the landscapes and the embroidery, which is that, you know, for me, it's the pattern that I'm stitching itself is a regular pattern just like all the little square tiles of this quilt are a regular pattern. But then the color choice, you know, in my pieces will bring out a landscape by just changing the colors of the stitches in specific spots. Whereas this, you know, they draw out this crazy, I don't even know what to call it, like a, like a bullseye, but a diamond, uh, whatever. <laughs> but like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like a radiating diamond. <laughs> like one of those, I feel like I'm going to be like hypnotized by it. But, um, but you know, that, that contrast between light, dark, light, dark is just, is like another layer over the pattern. Like that doesn't interrupt the pattern, just color choices of each little section of the pattern draw out this like additional image. Um, and so I felt like that was just a cool example, obviously very different style. This is very like geometric and graphic and stuff, but, um, but yeah, but it just like is a similar, is the same idea effectively. Um, so I, that just caught my eye. Yeah. And with, with this piece, you know, something that I was thinking about is um, there's a whole backstory with this piece about how um, like this was made for a young woman's trousseau and then her fiance died in the Civil War. And and like, you know, you can look at something and just be kind of mesmerized and awed by its beauty. And I'm like thinking about like your work too here. And but that there is like an underlying history or story that, um, or context, you know, that, that adds to its, its richness um, and goes kind of beyond the, that surface. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, I mean, as I said, it, it totally caught my eye when we were uh, yeah. seeing the exhibition. All right, so we have one more work from Multitudes, um, and this is a, a wood piece, a wood sculpture by John Scholl, who was a German immigrant, uh, a woodworker, a cabinet maker. He also built houses, I believe, turned sculptor in his 80s. Um, and, you know, this very like symmetrical um, decorative piece, but also with some nods to like functionality as well. But um, yeah, what I loved about this one, just as an example, was 
that he's employing all the techniques that he would have employed for making furniture, but just like removing it from that functionality and effectively just making it an artwork, which is this, I mean, one could argue that the embroidery that I work with is already decorative on dresses and how it's used originally. So it's not so much for the embroidery, but when it comes to the glass work and the, and the wood inlay work, it's like, those are usually reserved for functional things. And so I just thought it was cool because it's like, you can see, you know, all of his skill with using like a lathe to carve out these balls and stuff like that, like is just from making like cabinet, like chair legs and stuff. But then it's like, he does this with it instead. So I just thought it was a cool uh, example of like taking that technical skill, but then like being an artist with it. Totally. Well, thank you so much. I, I think we're now kind of in the like the Q and A portion. So um, I think we've got several several questions here. Um, there's a lot of questions about the collaborative, um, you know, nature of you know your relationship with the Palestinian embroiderers. Um, you know, there's some questions about are there particular patterns that are specific to each maker. Um, you know, it, or do they work kind of as a collaborative or, the, or do you work with individual women? Um, you know, maybe just going into that a little bit more. Um, yeah, so basically in its heyday, like early 1900s, late 1800s, um, Palestinian embroidery would have been done with a lot of, um, like a lot of differentiation based on location, right? So really, really used socially to identify people and where they're from. Nowadays, especially since, you know, the occupation and the Nakba happened in 1948 and the occupation in 67, like Palestinian society has been so fractured and also um, so much of, you know, luxury and like cultural things have been so much harder to maintain because you're living under occupation and stuff like that. Um, that, and I think it's also like globalization and all that kind of stuff. Basically nowadays you just have like general Palestinian embroidery. And if you really get into it, you might be able to figure out some of the origins of some of these um, motifs. And there's a lot of work being done to try to like uh, retain that information. But in practice, it's kind of been watered down to like anything goes with pat like you don't have to like only use this pattern if you're from this place or whatever um so there's definitely um you know and especially for me because i'm outside of that right like i'm from new york so like technically i could try to use patterns from my family's originally from gaza so like technically we i could try to use like gaza patterns only but it's like kind of a little too nitpicky and missing the point um and and the women that embroider now, like whether they're, I work with women in Bethlehem and especially in the Beheshi refugee camp in Bethlehem and then in Ramallah and also in Hebron. Um, they do all the, I'm sure they've done most of the patterns from everywhere. Like there's not really, they don't, I don't think people really perceive a difference. Plus in the late 1800s with more and more Europeans coming, like missionary, like priests, like whatever, like nuns and stuff there were also European um, motifs that got absorbed into Palestinian embroidery. So in actually in that artwork that we were looking at of mine, where um, I was talking about the color placement giving you such a different feeling for like the right panel, the left panel, those yeah. two smaller panels towards the center that are very figurative um, are derived from European embroidery patterns rather than being Palestinian originally because um, Palestinian embroidery is kind of older and in a sense like relies more on conceptual like abstract representation of items via cross stitch rather than trying to draw them literally figuratively. And so basically the rule of thumb is like if a, if a flower looks kind of pixelated, it's gonna be European origin. And if it looks like a geometric shape, but it's called a flower, that's probably like indigenous Palestinian pattern. But anyway, that, I mean, and, 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 and what's interesting is also the women in Palestine who still do this now wouldn't really 
consider a difference because it's like these European patterns have been being used in Palestine for hundred over a hundred years, whatever. So it, at this point, they're like just part of the Palestinian lexicon rather than no, I don't think people think of them as like, oh, these are like less Palestinian because they originally came from Europe. Um, but that's just like dorky, like deep in the embroidery <laughs> knowledge <laughs> uh, stuff to differentiate. Um, but I'm just like kind of flipping through these questions. Yeah, well, see. there's a couple that came up about, and, and I think this might be interesting for several people about um, gender in embroidery. Right. Um, and, um, you know, obviously it's associated with, with women's work. Um, and I'm assuming the same is true in Palestine. Um, so, you know, what was that like when you were sort of first getting started with the medium? Was that something you were consciously embracing? Um, or was it just like, I'm, you know, this is what you, I know you said you were a crafty kid to start right. with. Um, but, um, and how, and how, you know, when you were learning the techniques, um, how were you embraced in the, in the embroidering community? I will say that originally when I started doing this embroidery, it didn't dawn on me. It, it's not that it didn't dawn on me. Basically, I've always been flamboyantly gay and like teased for that and whatever. And to a, a certain extent, after enough years of that, it just became like, you know, when you're a teenager, you're trying to hide it. You're like tortured in school, whatever. Uh, but it's nothing works and people always can still tell you're gay at a certain point you just give up and you're like, whatever. And it's really freeing in a way because you can just be like, if this is girly, but I want to do it, I'll do it. And if this is boyish and, it, and I want to do it, I'll do it, like whatever. Um, and so, you know, another decade later, like I was so beyond worrying about if this is for girls or not that it didn't even really dawn on me. And then when I started going to Palestine and in interacting with embroiderers, and I remember when I first met the women that some of the ones that I still work with, they were really like kind of shy and embarrassed about me being a boy at first. Cause for them, like it's only women that do this. And so, uh, yeah, they were kind of giggly about it that I was a boy, but I brought like a, you know, something I was working on and they kind of inspected the stitches and they proclaimed that, oh, it must be because of my Palestinian blood that I, that I'm good at doing this. So like, I kind of earned their you approval that yourself, way. Yeah. yeah, and then over the years now, like we've been working together for so long that like, it's um, not a thing, you know? And I will say one of my favorite little things is that um, men will often crochet their own like skull caps. Okay. So it's not all textile work that's women also, um, like working the looms, like that that kind of uh, fabric I was talking about from Majda, like that's not a gender-based thing. Um, though the better when like rug type of loom weaving is usually women. So it just depends on like the item and the technique, I guess. Um, but, and I've only ever seen men doing like the glass work. I see women doing like ceramic painting. So like, it just really depends. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not exactly the same as like Western ideas of who should be doing what. Um, and just about the, um, I'm just kind of like trying to answer most of these in one swoop, but yeah. basically, uh, yeah, each woman has the freedom to apply the colors however she will. So in a sense, her own style goes into it when she does a piece for me versus another woman in the group there so I have a friend who lives in who's from the the history refugee camp in Bethlehem but now lives in Ramallah and he's essentially my like production guy there because I'm only there a couple times a year maybe so like it's not consistent enough for me to like go do the <laughs> the day-to-day -day work with the women and stuff so I'll send him my designs and he will cut the fabric down and like deliver kind of packages ready to go to the women who are embroidering. But he basically has assembled a few groups of women that all are kind of in the same communities. So they're kind of, you know, it's literally like, I've been to the one in Bethlehem where it's like a woman's house and her neighbor and they all work on it with like some other women from like the buildings nearby and they all know each other and probably some of them are related and like, you know, so it's like, there are these little groups like that. Um, and it's funny because in a way they're also like 
unofficially unionized in the sense that they all inter like one of them will interact with my friend and get the instructions and then deliver stuff back when she'll also be doing negotiations in terms of price and stuff like that so in a funny way it's like really fair for everyone and um I've over the years been very careful about you know being as not even fair but like doing like doing as much as I can for them in terms of um like paying them really well not being like I'm so like open to what they give me back and then because I only do my create like I kind of have an idea of what the piece is going to be when I design it but anything goes with the colors and stuff once they do their part and then once I get it back then I really do my creative process of figuring out the landscape and because of that you know a lot of other commissions these women will do will have very specific things and if they do it wrong they get either penalized or they have to do it again for you know without getting paid again or like whatever and I don't do any of that so they love it because I'll just take whatever they make and I'll make something out of it like I don't really care it's not I don't care but it's like I'm open to being it's creative. part of your whatever. process. Is yeah, it's like, process. it's about that for me. And so, so they love it because they don't, you know, and if it's, and I, and I always plan super far in advance so that if stuff, you know, because it's Palestine and Israel and things get delayed because there's suddenly like madness going on and stuff. And so I always plan things well in advance. So if it's a week or two late, it doesn't matter to me, which again is something that they might be penalized with from, other commissions and stuff like that um and you know and when we're really kind of you know my friend who does the production for me is part of their community they are, these are people that he's grown up with and so it's like I feel also extra safe having him be the one connecting me to them because like he cares about that you know what I mean it's like I make he like we're making sure that they're you know, really happy and treated well. And, and I want to make, you know, I, I'm able to incorporate them into the like economic tree of the like New York art world or whatever. And, you know, my work, there being demand for my work means that I'm able to make more work with them and have that stability for them. But also, um, you know, us paying them well and all that stuff makes it like, more lucrative for younger women or other women to take up the craft and continue you know so it's doing its part in terms of like keeping it going and keeping right. it being practiced and being um not dying out as a as a as a tradition um and the teams generally are around 10 people but it's like when we're working on a big project like most women, I would almost say all women, but most women in Palestine have been taught how to do this. That doesn't mean everyone likes doing it or is good at doing it, but everyone's like had their hands on embroidery at some point as a little girl or like whatever. And so there really is like an unlimited pool of people who you can add if you have a bigger project that needs more to get done sooner. You can just like literally ask the groups, like, do you guys have any friends or family that want to join in and help on this project and they probably do and the, so they kind of expand or contract depending on what we're working on um and I don't you know I'm just again breezing through these questions but I know I and we're right at 2 15 so we could maybe do like one quick one and then yeah <laughs> okay. Usually, I'm just saying like I don't really specify village to village the women and I was mentioning before like it's kind of watered down now so everyone does patterns from everywhere um, everything is by hand. There's no machine elements. Um, I use a fabric that I get over there that is called, they call it a cheesecloth, but like, I don't think it's a cheesecloth, but it's just a basic even weave cotton, like raw, like natural, like no bleach, nothing. Um, and yeah. And so I embroider and the women embroider, um, depending on the project either, you know, cause I've done shows recently where they're just pieces that I've embroidered and there's no collaborative works. And then I've done shows that are collaborative. So they're kind of both ongoing bodies of work. Um, and I really love that because I owe so much to all the women <laughs> doing this and has, that still do it and that have done it. And so, you know, I am Palestinian. And so like, in a way it's like fine, you know, fine for me to do this in terms of like cultural sensitivity, but it's extra special that I do get to work with women there and help, not help like charity, 
but contribute to their like success and well-being by being able to give them more commissions and like keep business flowing because this is what they do they do this not just for me for lots of people um and so yeah so I think that it's uh it's a nice way to kind of be connected with Palestine in a way that I never really would have expected and be a part of the community in a way that I could only have like dreamed of when I was younger and kind of wrestling with that um and yeah that's, well, that's thank you that. so much. Um, unfortunately, we have to end it here. I feel like we could have had like a three times as long talk <laughs> yeah. um, with all the all of all of your different bodies of work. But um, but I just want to thank you, Jordan, for such a special conversation and for offering such generous and insightful perspectives. Um, and so thank you for everyone who joined today and added your questions to the Q and A. Um, and you know, don't miss Jordan show up in New York if you're in New York I think it's open for another what week and a half yeah May 7th is the closing day and we're actually having a closing um like a closing reception um that day Saturday May 7th from 1 to 4 p.m we're gonna have I'm, I'm releasing a new zine that goes along with the show I'm launching a fundraising poster that will the proceeds will go to medical relief in Palestine and there'll be a musical performance by a, a Syrian friend of mine who is an amazing singer and is going to sing some Arabic music. Info that sounds is amazing. The, um, okay. Um, <laughs> it's going to be really fun and just a nice way to close out the show. So Awesome. And then if you're in Boston this summer, um, your show there opens in, in August. Um, August so, so don't miss that. Um, and also, if you can, please consider visiting the American Folk Art Museum in the coming months to check out Multitudes. It's on view through September 5th. And please be sure to join for our next virtual program, the Elizabeth and Erwin Warren Folk Art Symposium, Objects of Inquiry, New Perspectives on American Folk Art. And that's on May 22nd. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jordan. And um, take care. See you next time. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye.